It was a fiercely hot day in January in Rose Bay, Sydney. My friend Barry Mackay had asked me to come along to help interview Kitty Fisher. Kitty Fisher was a survivor of Auschwitz concentration camp and she had a story to tell which was going to be included in a documentary project that was being made in America on the men, the gay men, who were put into concentration camps and wore the pink triangle. Kitty's house was like a furnace and it was made a hundred times worse by the fact that we had to close all the doors and all the windows because the sound needed to be pure because this was an interview that was going to the film company. They wanted, obviously, to have perfect sound. But it didn't make any difference because the noise from the lawn of the cicadas, who were stridulating, was was unbearable. We couldn't we couldn't hear. So even with this incredibly tight little furnace that we were in, we still had the noise of the cicadas on the lawn. Barry said, look, we're going to have to start. We, we're just going to have to go. And I began asking Kitty the first question and the cicadas stopped like that. And suddenly it was deadly silent. And Kitty told her story. Kitty had also been involved with the making of Steven Spielberg's film, Schindler's List. So one of the first questions I asked her was how accurate was the depiction of Auschwitz in that film, which I admire greatly and have seen a number of times. She said, oh, about 1% accurate. I said, 1%? She said, yes, first of all, they couldn't show the lice. They couldn't show the lice that was in every part of our bodies, through our hair, in every orifice. You couldn't show the effects of typhoid, which were very, very manifest, particularly in the amount of diarrhea that uh, typhoid causes. Kitty's father was a cinema manager in Czechoslovakia. On the day that the Nazis took power, all Jews lost their jobs automatically. So he became unemployed. He'd fought in the First World War and lost a leg. So he was wearing an artificial limb. They moved to Slovakia and eventually they were put on a cattle truck and transported to Poland. They didn't know where they were going and they arrived at a place and there were guards outside the train windows who were shouting, Schnell, 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 quickly, 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 get off. The father had unfastened his artificial leg during the journey, which was horrendous because people were packed in and there was no sanitary uh, provision. It was incredibly hot. And he was putting his leg back on and the guards just shot him in front of his wife and Kitty and Kitty's little sister. They were then marched through the gate and there was a man sitting at a table with incredibly penetrating and cold blue eyes. He gestured to the left, to some people, he gestured to the right for others. For Kitty, it was to the right. For her mother and her little sister, it was to the left. Kitty ran after the mother and sister. The mother just continued walking, looking straight on. She never looked back. Kitty grabbed her little sister's hand, pulled her back, and they went to the right. Now, every night, they would go to the toilet block. And it was indescribable because many of the people in the camp had typhus, typhoid, and other gastric problems, so there was lots of diarrhea. Kitty and her sister noticed a man who was whitewashing the walls of the toilet block. And Kitty went up to him and she said, why are you here? You're not, you're not Jewish, you're not Polish, after he'd introduced himself. He said, no, I'm schwul. And Kitty looked, what does that mean, schwul? That means I'm a man that loves other men. He explained that he had been a portrait painter in Germany 
and he'd been transported to Auschwitz. And upon arrival, the commandant said, oh, I hear you're a, an artist, but we've got just the job for you. You'll be whitewashing the walls of the toilet block every night. And that's where he was. But he said to Kitty, look, I've got my food ration here, which was one or two baked potatoes in a tin. You can have them. And so, night after night, Kitty and her sister would visit the toilet block and the man would give them his food. Then one night he said to Kitty, can you weave? And she looked puzzled. He said, can you weave? She said, no. He said, you will say you can weave. And by saying that she could weave, she was able to go to a factory, to work in a factory outside Auschwitz, to go to another place. That's how she and her sister were able to survive because of this man. And Kitty, lying there on that couch, gasping for breath in that incredible heat, so much wanted to tell that story about that man whose name we will never now know. We don't know what happened to him. We do know that many of the gay men that were in concentration camps, if they survived, were put back into prison after the war because they were criminals, sexual deviants uh, under German law, not Nazi law, but just ordinary German law. And I, of course, was very moved by her story. It's something that I have lived with for a long time. And I wanted to go to Auschwitz. I wanted to see for myself. I'd seen lots of documentaries. I've read lots of books. And in December 2018, I went with my friends Robin and Carol. It was a cold, bleak morning. And I decided that I would make a small gesture towards that man and all the other gay people that were put into concentration camps. And I took off my overcoat, my scarf, and my sweater. And I had this very thin little shirt covered in daisies and wildflowers, just as probably Kitty and her family saw the lovely wildflowers when they arrived at Auschwitz and probably thought, oh, this is gonna be a nice place. And I stood in the freezing cold by the railway line that brought that cattle truck and many other cattle trucks to Auschwitz before the cold blue eyes of Dr. Mengele, as we now know. And I thought to myself, here I am, freezing cold for five minutes. What would it have been like to have been in that camp, not just in December, but in January, February, March, in Poland, wearing next to nothing, with virtually no food, and freezing conditions in your hut. What would it have been like for that group of people? And they included, of course, Russians, Hungarians, Czechs, Poles. It wasn't just the Jews, Jehovah's Witness, Communists, Gypsies, Freemasons, pretty much anyone that uh, deviated people that didn't fit in. And we now know, of course, it wasn't just national socialism, it was also international socialism. We know about the gulags now, which we didn't know in the 40s and 50s. We know about the incredible torture and deprivation and horrible persecution in communist countries. We know those things. But then something more chilling hit me as I stood there. I suddenly realised that after a few days in Poland, in Krakow, and then I went on to Warsaw, I had not seen any noticeably gay people. I had not seen any same-sex couple. I had not seen any rainbow flags. Uh, I went into the biggest uh, DVD store in Krakow, and then later in Warsaw, there were no gay films at all. And there'd been a particularly popular one that year, which was Call Me By My Name, there was no sign of that. The only film I saw that was remotely relevant to gay concerns was Cat on the Hot Tin Roof, which was made in 1958, and its gay subplot had actually been cut by the censors. And I thought to myself, there's a slippery slope here, isn't there? 
if you decide that any group is not in the national interest or doesn't fit in with what the gods or a god says, then you try and make life as difficult as possible for those people. And if they don't disappear, then maybe you might take steps to make them disappear. So when I stood there in that shirt, the daisy shirt, because remember that one of the slang terms for gay men is daisy, daisies. I thought of Kitty and I thought of that gay man whitewashing those walls endlessly, giving his food to those two little girls. And was he a hero? Kitty certainly thought he was a hero. She certainly thought he was a saviour because without him, they would have probably perished. And they didn't. They survived. And I go back endlessly to that day in January, with Kitty on the couch, and that din of the cicadas, which suddenly stopped when I asked her that first question. What did the cicadas mean? Who were they? What chorus were they? Were they a chorus of people that didn't want her to tell the story? Or were they a chorus of people saying, tell our story? Because of course, until very recently, really only the mid seventies, there'd been no mention that gay people had been persecuted by the Nazis, had been put in concentration camps. It's a very new part of our history and we must never, never forget it.